What's up, dude? I'm really hoping that this video can be the reason why you never want to spend your hard-earned money at a steakhouse ever again. With the exclusion of some of the best steakhouses in the world, why would you want to go spend 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, 150 dollars on a steak experience when you know you can make it better, cheaper, and faster at home? Let this video serve as a guiding light to make sure that your next steak is your best ever. Now let's go! First things first, you're gonna wanna choose the right steak to get the job done. Do you need some kind of Japanese A5 grade 10 a million monks massaged Wagyu beef? No! Just make sure you find a steak that has fat marbled into the meat. I think it's called intramuscular or intermuscular fat. It's one or the other. All this stuff, this little lightning streaks through the beef right here, that's what you're looking for. Today I'm using a piece of prime ribeye. Ribeye just happens to be one of my personal favorite cuts for steak. You could also go for New York strip or beef tenderloin. Those are some of the more expensive but good cuts. Although beef tenderloin is a little bit overrated if you ask me. Also, if you don't want to spend top dollar but you still want an incredible piece of meat, I highly suggest you try some of these more unknown cuts that are really, really good. Just as good as the other ones if you ask me. Those are four of my personal favorites and I'm honestly not sure why they're not more popular because they are truly spectacular. As far as the thickness goes, I would start with at least an inch and a quarter. Anywhere from an inch and a quarter to two inches is going to be your ideal thickness. If your steak is too thin, it's just going to overcook so easily in the pan before you can get a good crust on it and you don't want that. The next step in my process is gonna to be to temper your meat, which just means to pull it out of the fridge for a while before cooking. Now, this is a highly debated subject on the internet. A lot of people say that it doesn't matter at all. I say they're wrong. People have done side-by-side -side tests that are pretty convincing, but here's my theory. So putting a cold steak in a pan is taking energy away from the pan. You're gonna lose your crust. Loss of energy means loss of heat. Loss of heat means loss of color. Loss of color means loss of your sear, your crust, your flavor. For me, when I'm cooking a steak and I'm going through that searing process, I wanna keep my pan really hot, so I'm not gonna put a cold steak into a hot pan. I hope that makes sense. On another note, tempering does help your steak cook evenly. Now, before we start cooking, I like to lightly oil it just to get to the seasoning process here. And this oil acts almost like a binder in the barbecue world, meaning it's gonna help the seasoning stick. So just lightly oil all the way around the steak. And season, you can use whatever you want. You can use just salt. Right now, I'm using my famous homemade rosemary salt. I'll put a link to that recipe at the end of this video if you wanna learn how to make it. It's a herb salt with rosemary, sage, garlic, and lemon. It is incredible. And then I'll just tap it in just a little bit. You wanna season a steak heavily, but don't overdo it, you know what I mean? Especially with the rosemary salt, since it's a blended salt. That looks perfect right there. And a little bit of Sergeant Gilbert reporting for duty. Sergeant Gilbert, you really are the man. That's just black pepper. And when it comes to the black pepper, I've seen some people like Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> Do pepper, that's way, 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 way too coarse, meaning he lets it be super thick on the steak. And if you do that, you're literally lifting your steak off the pan, so you're losing your contact to the pan, losing your sear, your color, your flavor. So I say finely ground when it comes to the pepper. At least fine enough to where you know you're not gonna lift your steak off the pan. Season heavily, and we're seasoning a little bit around the steak. And as we go to the other side, we're gonna dip up the edges like this. Flip and repeat that same process. Another pro tip I have for you is using a piece of string. If you need, let me explain. Sometimes with these higher grades of beef, you can see right here, it's really prone to coming apart. And especially when I start cooking it, it might start falling apart in the pan, which we don't want because it's gonna overcook then in certain places. So I'm just gonna take a little piece of butcher's twine right around the middle here, wrap it a few times. And we're just gonna make sure that's right around the middle of the steak, like so, and then just sort of clamp it down, right? And you can see how it's pushing everything together. And that's really just gonna help this steak cook evenly and make sure I have one nice medium rare all the way throughout. And depending on which steak it is, you're not gonna have to do this, but as you can see, that made one nice compact steak, which is gonna help it really cook well. I like to let my steak sit for about 10, 15 minutes with the salt prior to cooking. There's been a lot of experiments done about dry brining. Some people will do this 24 hours in advance. There are pros and cons to each. For me, I feel it's the most juicy when just doing it 10 or 15 minutes. That's how I like it anyway, to each their own. Before we cook, you wanna get a few aromatics ready. This is what you're gonna use later when you baste the steak. Starting here with a shallot, all I'm gonna do is slice it in half. You don't even need to peel this. People go too crazy. If you wanna take a little bit of the peel off, you can. Don't need to do it. That's done. Now here's a pro tip for the garlic. Leave the peels on and just smash it once like that. You wanna keep it in the peel. Why? Because when you put it in the pan without the peel, it's gonna burn a lot faster. Leaving the peel on is like leaving a little coat of protective armor that's gonna keep it from burning, but it's still gonna cook inside there and then release its flavor into the butter. And lastly, we're just gonna need a couple sprigs of thyme here to add a little floral herbaceous note to this steak. I say herbs, okay? A lot of Americans get mad at me. They say, it's herbs, dude. I'm from 
Look, the rest of the world pronounces the H in it. It's just us Americans that leave it out. So not that weird. If you want, you could also use rosemary or sage for that, but they were in my rosemary salt, so I'm going with thyme. I'm gonna be cooking this steak in Maiden's stainless steel pan, which I'm proud to say is the sponsor of today's video. Maiden Cookware designs professional quality products for the home cook. And when three Michelin star chefs from Chicago's Alinea and New York's La Bernardine trust these pans, then so do I. Today, we're gonna be talking about made in stainless steel line of pans, which is your kitchen workhorse. You can literally use them for everything. They're made in Italy and they feature a five ply stainless steel material, which really helps to set them apart from other pans. And if you've never worked with five ply material stainless steel pans before, you are definitely gonna feel the difference. I can tell you from personal experience, they heat up super fast. They then hold their heat very, very well. So they have excellent heat retention and they even cool down faster than other pans, which I love as well. The handles are even designed to stay cool while you're working on the stove top. And they have this excellent ergonomic design that's very nice to hold. They just have a great feel to them and really nice balance. Another great feature of these pans is they can go straight from a stovetop into an 800 degree oven. Let's say you have a pizza oven and you want to do that, you have that possibility. The curvature of the wall of the pan is made for deeper searing and easier flipping. While that rolled rim around the very edge helps for pouring sauces directly out of the pan, which is something I actually really care about. Coming up here, you're going to see me execute one of my perfect pan fried steaks in their pan so you can judge for yourself whether or not it looks great. Check out the stainless steel collection as well as Made In's other cookware by clicking the link down in the description to save on your order. Thank you Made In for sponsoring this video and now back to the tutorial. I'm gonna bring my pan up to high heat. This is always how I start a steak and before you put any oil or anything in the pan, leave it on the flame for anywhere from three to five minutes depending on the thickness of your pan and then you add the oil and then you start cooking. If you do everything too soon, you're gonna lose all the temperature in the pan when you put your steak in. Once it's hot, I'm adding some avocado oil. This is just a neutral oil I happen to love. Super high smoke point, really clean flavor. You could use peanut oil or another high smoke point oil if you like. My cameraman was just saying that steam is what you want, right? It's smoke, right? So now that oil is smoking, it's rippling. You can see how it shimmers on that pan when I tilt it. It's hot, right? When you're cooking a steak at home and you're doing this for the first time, you should be a little scared. I'm not, but I've done it a million times. I have some healthy fear around it. I don't want to get burned. So gently set the steak in and always turn it away from yourself, right? I've burned myself really bad before by dropping the steak in and letting it fall towards me, right? Always let it fall away so if the oil splashes, is it goes out that way. On another note, if you have a smoke alarm right in your kitchen, you might want to take the battery out just while you cook and definitely open up some windows because this is a smoky situation. It's just how it is. There's no avoiding it if you want to cook a steak properly inside. Another thing I'll sometimes do is just put a little bit of pressure on top, not to smash it, but just to make sure that it has a good contact to the bottom of that pan. And another thing you can do is if you've had the steak on one side of the pan, turn it to the other and you can listen and you can hear the difference in the sear because as you've had the steak right here, it's taking energy away from that half of the pan. So to move it back and forth can be really good to maintain a really good sear. It's been about two minutes. What I'm gonna start to do is just peek under and look to see if it's done, right? There's no reason you have to flip the whole steak over to, to check it. Just get eye level with the pan and tilt up. Looks pretty good right about now. I'm gonna flip and look at that. Most amazing, beautiful sear, right? A lot of times I'll lift the steak too, make sure the oil's under there. And we'll start cooking on the other side. When that other side is nicely seared, about another two minutes, looks perfect. I'm gonna take the steak out and set it over here on a little resting rack. Now at this point, I'm gonna turn my pan all the way down to low. My theory here is that steak just got an aggressive sear on the outside. And so all that heat is now starting to transfer into the middle. We're just doing a little bit of an on the heat, off the heat method, which I really love for steak. And now with my pan on low, here's what you wanna do. Start with the shallot. A lot of times when you see people base steak at home, they'll throw the shallot, the garlic, the herbs all in at one time. And in my opinion, that's not the best way to do it. The shallots are gonna take the longest. So we start with those, right? Let them sear. And there's one thing you need to remember about basting is that fat carries flavor, right? The fat is the butter we're about to put in here as well as the oil and the beef fat left over from searing the steak. And so when we put all those aromatics in with the butter, the butter picks up that flavor and then disperses it over the steak. It's a beautiful thing, right? And so all I'm looking for with these little shallots is a nice golden brown color. We'll go a little longer. All right, we've got a nice golden brown color on our shallots. I'm gonna move those down here. Now we'll put in our crushed garlic. About 30 seconds on the garlic. Now I'm adding cold unsalted butter. It doesn't need to be cold. About two tablespoons or so, maybe a little less. Keep that heat low right? The hardest part about basting is maintaining the temperature. If you have it too hot, your butter is going to burn, leave a nasty flavor, right? As you can see now, golden brown and foaming like this. Now we put the steak in, gentle, and then I'm going to keep that heat low and just baste. Simple as this. You can see that nice foaming butter, right? So we got our heat perfect. 
So remember when you baste, heat goes all the way down to low. And then if you feel like it's not hot enough, increase a little bit from there. But I would always start all the way down low because there's still a lot of heat in the pan left over from when you seared it. I can't wait for you who's watching this video right now to go in the kitchen and I hope you're super excited about this and make yourself a steak and realize it's better than any steak you've ever eaten in a steakhouse. That's a beautiful thing. That's freedom. About two minutes of basting, I'm gonna take it out and flip it. And I'm just gonna keep the heat low on my pan. Here's the thing about basting, right? That's a lot of extra heat coming over the top of the steak while the pan cooks from the bottom. And when you do this, it means your steak is gonna carry over cook a lot more. Meaning normally you might pull a steak at 125, 128 degrees for medium rare around 135. When you're basting, you might wanna pull it at 115, 110, 118, depends on the steak, but it's gonna carry up much more. So that's a pro tip and something to really remember if you wanna get good at cooking steak with the basting method. I'm just gonna go ahead and start poking a thermometer in there right now. Seems to be about 110, right? 115 or so. Another high level thing that I used to be good at, but can't really do anymore, is you take a cake tester like this, right? You can put it to your lip and judging by the temperature of how hot this little piece of metal is on your lip, you can tell how done the steak is inside. It's a high level thing. I'm not that good at it, but it is possible. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna get a little more heat in my pan, steak back in, and it's always gonna make a little noise when you drop it back in the pan because some of those juices are starting to come out of the steak. Now, remember the time? This is what we do last. You do this right away, your time is just gonna burn by the time your steak is done, right? You hear the way it crackles in there? Awesome. Here we go, one final base for maybe a minute. That's it, about a minute 30, get it out. You do not wanna overcook that steak. One of my favorite parts about cooking a steak like this, the shallots, oh my God. Be the best freaking onion you ever try, right? The garlic as well, still in the peel. Time, why not, throw it on there. You can even serve it with this butter in the pan after you slice it. A lot of times I'll just dribble some on right there. And then I might put a little bit more on after we slice it up. The last and probably most crucial part of cooking a steak, let it rest. As a general rule, you wanna rest it half as long as you cooked it. So if I spent eight minutes cooking it, I would rest it for four minutes. However, I even like to go a little bit over that. So if I cook it for eight minutes, I might rest for five. Let me put it this way. I would rather over rest it and put a little heat back into it than under rest it and slice into it and let all those juices run out. That's what happens if you slice it too early. So let it rest. Today, I pulled that one around 118 degrees Fahrenheit and it went all the way up to 135 as it rested. However, having said that, sometimes I'll just use the force, right? Put the thermometer down, put on the blindfold and just feel it out. And honestly, whenever I do that, it always seems to work out better. I'm not even joking. Sometimes thermometers screw me up. There we go, my friends, moment of truth. It's been five minutes, taking off that string. And this is a ribeye, right? So that is my favorite part right there, the cap. Oh, it just feels so tender. Can't you see me poking it? So we're gonna take off that cap. See how it just wants to come off right there. We'll just follow the seam. Let's start with this. Oh my gosh. Oh! We'll just slice in here. Oh my gosh. Ooh! Wow. Cut into this eye now. Mm. Let's lay out our steak here. Just use the knife to tap it down. Our cap. Oh. Woo! Throw some of our shallots down here. These are just the best thing you could serve with. Some garlic. Even all those drippings in the bottom of the pan. There's your sauce. Look at that. Oh my God. My mouth is watering. Marcus, come on down. Let's freaking eat this thing before my head explodes. Oh my gosh. Marcus will be our guinea pig. Cheers. Uh You gotta say, Marcus, why should someone go to a steakhouse and spend $50 when they could spend 15, 20 bucks, make this at home, feed two people? Mm. You can eat more steak at your house, mm. cooked exactly how like this, and save so much money. Marcus, here's something I really want you to try. The uh, shallot, dip it in some of the juices, whatever. Tell me that isn't the best onion you can have. Mm. Oh my God. It's beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. Dude, the only reason you gotta say anything <laughs> is because you can't just throw this in their mouth right now. A grilled steak is amazing, okay? There's nothing wrong with a grilled steak, but when you learn how to do this in a pan, it's just something you can kind of never come back from, right? Marcus, you're a home cook. You feel like you can do this now? I mean, you just watched the whole tutorial. You could get this done. You could impress all your friends. And if somebody said they don't like this, you fight them. It might take a little practice. You might not nail it the first time, but you can definitely do this. 
Thanks for hanging out with me today. Here are two more beef recipes from my channel that I know you're gonna love. I'll also have links down in the description to some of my favorite products and equipment I use on this channel, as well as some pretty sweet merch we now have available for purchase. And until next time, you know I love you on the map.